everyone. As uh, you just heard, I'm going to talk about phages in the human microbiome. The topic of phages in microbial communities has become very popular recently. This is motivated in part due to the fact that phages are a major source or cause of cell death in microbes. Our approach is explicitly cultivation independent and we used genome resolved metagenomics. This means that we study DNA that's extracted from entire communities, sequenced and assembled. From this approach, it is possible to reconstruct the genomes of bacteria and archaea. The genomes may be near complete or even curated to completion in some cases. They may be partial or some of the sequences may be unassembled as is illustrated in this, um, this puzzle of, um, analogy on the left. In addition to the genomes of bacteria and archaea, it is possible to reconstruct the genomes of phages, the viruses of bacteria, and also of plasmids and other extra chromosomal elements. And just incidentally, it's also possible to reconstruct reasonably decent genomes for microbial and even uh, macroscopic eukaryotes. Let me introduce this approach to those of you who have not um, become familiar with it. On the left-hand side of this screen, is a representation of a microbial community with many different organism types and of course with phages. We extract the DNA from all of these entities. We sequence it using short read sequencing for the most part. These reads are assembled into contiguous DNA sequences, contigs, and then the contigs that belong to the same genome are assigned to the same bin to comprise a draft genome. Generally speaking, bacterial genomes are in the few megabase size range, and we might expect that phage genomes are on the order of about 50 KB, 50,000 base pairs. But is that actually the case? What first caught my attention was an analysis we were conducting with Joe Santini at University College London of the microbiomes of the gut of uh, people from Bangladesh who had been impacted by arsenicosis, so arsenic poisoning. These genomes were manually curated to completion and it was apparent that just a few individuals contained many phages with very large genomes. The ones shown here are all greater than 200 KB. The genomes of particular interest were those that were the largest on the order of 540 kilobase pairs. I'm going to refer to these as the LAC clade because they were discovered in LAC-SAM in Bangladesh. And I'm going to talk about these two specific genomes as A1 and A2. So this, this research is published and the first order was order devoto. So the first question when you find phages of that size might be, who is the host? In which bacterium are they replicating? There are a variety of ways to go about linking phages to their hosts, but I think the most compelling is to use the spaces of the CRISPR locus. Of course, you all know CRISPR means clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, the repeats shown in the top figure in black, and in this bottom diagram of the actual data as green um, lozenges. The spaces tend to be all different to each other, and some of them derive from phages, most of them derived from phages, some from plasmids and other extra chromosomal elements. In the bottom part of this figure, you can see a region of the genome of Prevotella, a major organism in the gut microbiome. In this region of the Prevotella genome, there is a CRISPR locus as shown here. The first is from um, one day, day four, of the life of person number 26, and then the second from day five, and so on and so forth. So several of the samples that were obtained from this cohort of individuals from Bangladesh had CRISPR loci that targeted these large LAC phages. And you can see here in the red um, arrows that the spaces that have targets to the A1 and A2 phage are indicated um, in red. So from this, we deduce that LAC phages replicate in Prevotella. When we look at the gut microbiomes of these individuals, individual subject names are on the bottom. In these stack bar charts, we can represent the overall microbiome composition. I'm focusing here specifically 
on this um, gold color, which are the um, genotypes that were assigned to the genus Prevotella. So within one bar, there are many segments. Each one of these segments represents a distinct species of Prevotella. So take home point, these human microbiomes are dominated by Prevotella, as were, for the most part, the samples from which the lacphage was either detected or genomes reconstructed. What really caught our attention when looking at the gene predictions for these phage genomes is that they looked all wrong. When we go through the standard process of assigning open reading frames, we expect to see that the majority, 90% or more of the genome will be covered by open reading frames. This was clearly not the case. In the top panel here, we can see where the genes would be predicted to be located if we use the standard bacterial code, code 11. Clearly something is wrong. We can go ahead and we can test for alternative assignments of the stop codons and we find that the UAG or if you prefer TAG stop codon is not acting as a stop but is actually coding for an amino acid. And when we adjust the code in this way, we can see that the majority of the genome, the vast majority of the genome is as expected and the genes that should be predicted are predicted in their entirety rather than fragmented. Looking at this a little bit more closely, this is the phage A1 with the standard bacterial code prediction. This is called code 11. And here now with this alternative code in which the stop codon TAG has been reassigned, we can see much better and more realistic and appropriate gene predictions. This is actually code 15. If we zoom in on a region of this genome and compare it to the regions in other genomes from related phages, A1, A2, and another phage from a cholera patient, we can see two examples of where near the beginning of the gene, there is a stop codon that would terminate this gene if read as a stop. If we zoom in on this region and down here, this region, we can see that there is a polymorphism that has converted an, a codon that normally would code for glutamine into TAG. From this and from the second example, again, it appears to be aligned with the a glutamine. And from many other examples, we can determine that the most likely translation in this code for TAG is glutamine. This is a region of the um, phage genome for A2 aligned with A1, so the two from the Bangladesh cohort, in which we calculate over a sliding window the percentage of in-frame as in within gene TAGs, so where TAG has been reassigned to glutamine. We can see that it varies dramatically. These regions of red, there is no in-frame TAG. The regions where the blue peaks can be found are regions where there are many in-frame TAG. When we look at the distribution of structural proteins on this genome, shown here in blue and numbered, we find that virtually all of them are in regions where there is high use of the TAG stop codon to code for glutamine. So in other words, if this code was read in the normal way, these genes, all of these structural genes would be fragmented. When we looked across many cohorts, humans and animals that were available in our data and public data, we found that this is a common phenomenon but mostly in people with a non-Western style diet. And this is not surprising because non-Western style diet does in fact correlate with the dominance in most cases of Prevotella versus Bacteroides. So we can see here on the left, on the right hand side, the groups of individuals and um, animals such as baboons and pigs that were shown to contain many lac phages. In fact, Almost all of the Danish pigs and all of two social groups of baboons from Kenya contained the lac phages. They were not found in these um, other cohorts shown on the left-hand side. We picked up this study more recently with a targeted effort in collaboration with Joe Santini again to try and find how widespread these lac phages are and how diverse they might be. So. Joe collected samples from zoos and from pigs and horses 
and some other animals, including actually tortoises. And we analyzed them with a variety of method, methods, including PCR, where the PCR products were sequenced and also uh, metagenome reconstruction. What we find here is that there are many closely related MAC phages to be found in these animals and humans. The humans are in this aqua color. The baboons, for example, are in this gold color. But notably, many of the phages that are present in humans and other animals are very, very closely related. Similarly, there are phages in animals that are closely related to phages in other animals. So it, it would appear that these lac phages probably migrate relatively easily amongst different animal microbiomes, including the human. For example, shown here, dogs, pigs, and humans. As part of this analysis, we determined that the lac phage genomes are not as constrained as we first found. Previously, the genomes were all close to 540 KB. Now we have genomes that range from 476 to the huge size of 660 KB, this largest one being found in a horse. And I should say, these genomes are manually curated to completion, so we do know the genome size. When we analyzed this data in the publication that was uh, just published in iScience, headed by Marco Krisky and Linsing Chen from my lab and, and Marco from Joe's lab, we found some interesting things about the proteomes or the predicted proteomes of these lac phages. In the diagram on the left, you can see each row is a genome and each gray box indicates presence or absence. We can see here clearly that the lac phages that come from different animals tend to cluster together when we cluster them based on protein content. From this, we take away that phages in specific animal cohorts tend to be more similar in terms of their protein content than phages from other environments. In boxes here, we can see numbers. These numbers indicate protein groups, groups of proteins or protein families that are typical of, for example, in this top case, pigs or um, baboons, for example, in the case of two. In the case of six, we have proteins that are present in the um, majority of lac phages, but notably there are some phages with higher GC that cluster separately and these lac these protein groups. So some animal specificity associated with protein families. We continued this work when we became aware of the existence of large phages in the human and animal gut microbiomes by asking the question, where in general do we find huge phage? And how does the size of the phage we find compare to expectation based on the public data? So this paper published recently by my lab in collaboration with many people who were mostly data providers reports that clades or groups of related huge phage are found across a huge diversity of Earth's ecosystems. This is a complicated figure, but I think I can talk you through it. First of all, on the outside ring, we have the genome size and on the inside we have a phylogenetic tree. This is a phylogenetic tree constructed using the terminase protein sequence. The clades are indicated here in colors, so related groups are highlighted by these colors. From the code in the second ring from the outside, we can see many, many different ecosystems. And we can see the types of organisms that they are hosted by. I want to draw your attention in particular to the red color in the second outermost ring, because these are the, la the large phages, not lac phages, but large phages that are present in the human microbiome. And this was just one first study. By the way, the lac phages are indicated here. So some of these phages are much larger than the lac phages reported at that time. So putting this into perspective, here we have a size scale on the bottom left. Here is the range now of phage genomes. Here is the range of some small celled bacteria that we've done a lot of work on ourselves that are also present in various human microbiomes, the CPR bacteria, such as um, TM7, Zakari bacteria, or Gracilli bacteria, or OD1, uh, Parkibacterium. 
Minimal bacterial genomes are even smaller. Some of the smallest symbionts have genomes of the size indicated here. So clearly phages in some cases have genomes that are larger than bacterial genomes. Interestingly, uh, Guillaume Borel had published a paper from Lac Pavon in France where he had imaged phages from the sediment. This happens to be a site that we have also studied and we have reconstructed some of these phages from this, this lake environment. You can see from these images that these are huge capsids consistent with them being from phages with huge genomes. This is a different way to look at the data in this plot we show genome size on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, and um, some other statistics such as genome count and tRNA content on the, on the y-axis. First of all, though, let me point out this blue envelope. This shows the distribution of sizes that were at the time pre present in the public data. On top of this, we superimpose the new genomes just from this one study now published um, a year or so ago, a year and a half ago. Here are our lac phages at the time. From this, you can see that these genomes are substantially larger than would be expected based on the average known genome side of, size of phages, which comes out to be about 55 kb. We would posit that this is a reflection of the fact that the isolation methods used to study phages selects strongly against large phages. So many of these genomes are really large. The largest is now 735 KB. So very, very substantially larger than 55 KB. Interestingly, perhaps we can see that the largest phages encode many tRNAs. In fact, almost 70 of them in the largest genome, and that this tends to increase in prevalence as the genomes become larger. We can also see, not shown here, that some genomes have tRNA synthetases, and in one case, up to 15 different tRNA synthetases, and some even have ribosomal proteins. Not ribosomes, but maybe one or two, maybe maximum of three ribosomal proteins. If we look at the phylogeny of those ribosomal proteins, we ask who, which proteins are they most closely related to, we find that they are closely related but distinct from bacterial proteins. In this tree, the phage names are indicated in red and the circles with color indicate cases where we could confirm that the hosts were Bacteroidetes by, for example, CRISPR targeting. So these phages have um, tRNA synthetases that are related to, but distinct from, related Bacteroidetes. So we would infer from this that the phage has acquired and maybe evolved these tRNA synthetases to function slightly differently to those of their hosts. So why might phages encode translation-related genes? To give you a sense of the list of translation encoded factors found on these just few hundred large to larger than 200 KB phages, we see already the tRNAs and the tRNA synthetases, but also found our initiation factors, elongation factors, as I mentioned, ribosomal proteins, and also release factors. So this is a substantial set of possible translation related genes. We posited in this publication that there's a reason for this. And that reason is to basically switch the function of the bacterial ribosome away from translating bacterial mRNAs to translating those of the phage. Now, this is a complicated diagram, but there are a couple of simple things that help to understand. The red are phage encoded things. This is the phage genome and the blue are the bacterial components. And of course, the bacteria is the one that contributes the ribosome. As we can see here, these components are involved in initiation, elongation, and termination. But perhaps the most interesting observation is that the sequence of ribosomal protein S21, which is quite common in phages, has modification that likely enables it to initiate translation of phage-specific transcripts. This is a hypothesis, but it makes sense that these phages would carry genes that have this function of switching the ribosome to favor their own translation um, scheme. Some phage have CRISPR-2. 
this is a little bit of an aside, but it's interesting to note that these CRISPR spaces tend to target phages that infect the host of the huge phage. So we infer from this that huge phage arm their host to defend against their competitors. So I want to switch back now to talk about alternative genetic codes. This is the bacterial code, bacterial code 11, and it, it uses three stop codons, TAA, TAG, and TGA. And most bacteria, but not all, use this code. There are other possibilities in the genetic code. For example, they may have alternative start codons. They may have alternative stop codons. They can have recoded stop codons, as we saw for the lac phages. And this has also been seen in bacteria, for example, um, a couple of groups called Mycoplasma and Spiroplasma, and in CPR bacteria, Gracilli bacteria, and Abscondita bacteria. So cryptic code changes are also possible, but as yet, I think, highly un understudied. So let's look at the stop codon reassignment. This is work that's been led by Adair Borges and is covered in a recent preprint from um, her work, describing her work. In this work, she looked in a relatively, and as much as possible, unbiased way to predict what percentage of phages in the human and animal gut microbiome use recoded stop codons, any stop codon that has been reassigned. And she concluded that as much as 6% of the phages can use these alternative codes. The workflow is described here, but basically she looks for the situation where when you predict the genome with standard code, bacterial code 11, you get this very um, low coding fraction, low coding density. But when we uh, use an alternative code, we recover normal protein predictions. So she did this to, she did this analysis and applied it to many different groups um, and divided it by subject type. And the plot on the right is showing the code density, if you predict the code, predict the genes using um, code 11. And we can see here humans that eat a Western diet, WD, humans eat a non-Western diet, horses, pigs, cattle, and baboons. And you can see here also the genome size on the x-axis. But mostly I want you to focus on the colored dots, which is where we can see evidence of recoding. In the Western diet, we see a few um, phages, relatively few phages have been alternatively coded and both TGA and TAG recoding have occurred. In the humans, eating a non-Western diet, recoding is much more prevalent, but so far only TAG recoding. And in these other animal cohorts, there are sometimes many, many phages that show evidence of alternate coding, both TAG and TGA recoding. So Adair assigned these phages to different clades based on their phylogeny, just as we did in the huge phage across ecosystem study. This is a breakdown of the types of alternatively coded phages that were found in this cohort set that she analyzed. Humans with a Western diet clearly on the left have a very different mixture of alternatively coded phages than other um, cohorts. Um, and in fact, they're largely dominated by these crass-like phages that were reported by um, Eugene Coonan and collaborators a short time ago. Not so similar are the other um, animal microbiomes and humans that eat a non-Western diet. To summarize what she found, she found these different clades, as shown in the previous slide, are linked to host phyla that are Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, which are common abundant organisms in the human and animal gut. She found that the sizes ranged enormously, for example, from as short as 15 kb up to this huge lac phage of 660 kb. She also observed something very interesting, and that is that one clade, one group of related phages can sometimes have representatives that are the standard code, TAG recoded, and TGA recoded. This tells us that it's probably pretty easy for um, phages to switch their code from one coding system to another. This beautiful diagram is really complicated, but it shows the same thing just in a different way. 
on the inner circle, we can see the clades that were named in the previous diagram. And you can see here in two groups, those that infect Bacteroidetes and those phages that infect Firmicutes. On the outer ring, you can see the size, again, emphasizing the huge range of size of alternatively coded phages. In this ring, you can see the type of recoding. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that there is a lot of admixing of standard and alternate codes. As an aside, these here, TGA to tryptophan, are phages that infect bacteria that use that same alternative code. This distinguishes them from all other cases, which are really, really interesting because the phage is using a genetic code that differs from that of its host. So, highlighting this, I have a red circle showing that this group of amethyst group phage have mixed highly related phages with, the, with alternative codes of both types plus standard code. And that's true also for this clade over here of agate phages. We're going to zoom in on this clade in the next slide. So here we have um, an, a diagram that indicates the genomic or genome-wide relatedness of a bunch of related phages from the agate clade. On the horizontal axis, we have average nucleotide identity, and 90% is the dashed line. From this, you can see that there are really amazing, I think, cases where phages that are quite, quite closely related to each other use different codes, TGA recoded, and in this case, not recoded. If we make a genome alignment between these TGA and non-reassigned um, phages, so a TGA recoded and a standard code phage, we can see that they are indeed very similar based on the plots of A and I. But we can also see something super interesting. And that is, again, that the genes shown in these boxes that are colored contain in-frame TGA that would be read as a stop if implemented in the standard code. The other thing that really stands out from this diagram is that this is the region of the genome that encodes structural and lysis proteins rather than DNA-related proteins. One might wonder, how is this possible that two such closely related phages could have alternate codes? They must have switched pretty recently. A clue to how they may switch is that a phage that is standard code has only a very, very limited use of TGA as a stop. So it's sort of already been phased out before it's reassigned. We think this is really an important <coughs> precursor to code switching. Here are a couple of examples of phages from two different clades. The first on the left is from a crass phage. <coughs> but based on the GC skew, we can predict the location of the origin and terminus of replication. This would predict bidirectional replication from one origin to the terminus. We see in gold the genes that have in-frame TAG, otherwise stop codons, and that these are the structural and lysis protein regions. On the other replicor, we see avoidance of the in-frame stop, and in some cases, the encoding of DNA replication proteins. Similarly, but more complicated, is the case for the agate phage on the right-hand side, where the indications are that the genome replicates from two origin to two termini. Again, the origin, uh, the uh, replicors are, are pretty uneven in their terms of their length, but we see this pattern of specific um, regions where we find in-frame TGA reassignment and other regions where TGA is being avoided as a stop codon. And again, structural and lysis proteins being partitioned to this um, region with in-frame TGA codons. It's really notable, and she was able to so show statistical support for a higher than expected prevalence of these recoded stop codons in some very interesting genes. And just simply put, genes that would be late stage expressed and critical in cell lysis. So you can imagine that this is a mechanism to prevent early translation of genes that would be detrimental to the phage if they were um, functional too early in the replication cycle. Also really interesting is the fact that some of these um, groups have carried carry a set of proteins that are likely involved in code change.
By this, I mean that early in replication, the only system, the only machinery available is the standard bacterial system. But if the phage can um, implement the operation of its own genes that are involved in code switching, it can flip the ribosome to read the alternative code. For example, in this case, there's a, there's a release factor one, which recognizes TAA and TAG stop codons, but not TGA, which has been reassigned. There is a tRNA synthetase that we think probably has some function in loading the tRNA. And, um, and there is a, I didn't say, there's a tRNA that knows how to read, presumably the TGA stop codon sub tRNA. So they bring along with them, in some cases, very clear set of machinery that enact the, the, the code change. So to summarize again, here's the phage genome. Here are the stop codons. Early on, the stop codons must be read as stop, will be read as stop, because that's what the bacterial machinery are. But after the code change is implemented, the late genes can be translated in this case, where TAG is, re is read as glutamine. So this is how we see this happening. There's an early infection standard code. At some point, the sub-tRNA that can recognize the stop codon and load an amino acid is produced, as is the protein involved in amino isolation with the desired amino acid. And only after this can the lysis genes be effectively translated. So this mechanism is a potential regulator of late stage gene expression genes that would be very detrimental if accidentally um, expressed at an early stage of infection. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is prophage. And so one of the things that's turned up, I think that's extremely interesting, is the fact that normal code genomes like Prevotella have, in some cases, an integrated phage or a prophage that is alternatively coded. This is very evident in this top line where we can see the black arrows representing genes are really short in the region of the prophage. When these genes are repredicted in an alternative code, we can see that we recover the expected genes with the expected coding density. What's interesting is that the integrase is not recoded. I want to mention that if we look at the map reads to, this, um, to regions such as this, in this case, this is a topaz prophage. We can see that the coverage by the reads is really highly anomalous over this prophage region. From this, we take away that coexisting in this population are the prophage, the integrated phage, and also many, many phage particles. In this case, we are just comparing the Prevotella genome with the prophage garnet prophage, and another genome, in this case from a firmicute, which also has a prophage. Both of these are TAG recoded. The fact that the integrase is not recoded may indicate that st stop coding, stop codon reassignment is a way to regulate the lysogenic lytic switch. Okay, so just to um, finish up here, this is a diagram that provides an overview of what we think is happening with these alternatively coded phages in the human and other microbiomes, animal microbiomes in particular. Early after injection of the DNA into the cell, the standard code is read. So the genes must, early expressed genes or early produced transcripts must not use an in-frame stop codon. After this, we produce the tRNA that can load the amino acid onto what would normally be a stop codon. In some cases, the phage, in other cases, other amino acid um, tRNA synthetases that can load the tRNA and release factors that can regulate which stop codon is read, preferring the stop codon that the phage wants the ribosome to use. Later on, there's a switch as these uh, proteins and, and transcripts become available. And then the alternative code is implemented, probably to the detriment of the bacterial system, and lysis and structural proteins are produced, allowing the phage to escape the cell and go on with its existence. 
So that's all. I want to thank you for your attention and uh, give particular thanks to my co-workers, um, Audra, Bassam, Rohan, Adair, Linsing, and Marco, and collaborator Joe Santini and Claire um, Liu. I want to also acknowledge the funding from various sources, including the National Institute of Health, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, the Miller Institute, which um, funds Adair's uh, postdoctoral fellowship, and um, Genome Canada, which provided some of the sequencing used in the study. And thank you again for your attention. I would be happy to have um, any questions.